Angela Cripps, the MD of the recruiting gym. And this week it's all about the recruitment process. So we're going to take each step as it goes along. Um, each phase is broken into four. So let's have a look at what phase one is all about then. So taking your qualified position, making a recruitment plan, sourcing the candidates and then qualifying those candidates. So let's uh, have a look at these uh, step by step then. So taking the qualified position. This isn't a simple thing. This is about questioning, 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 questioning and getting as many um, answers as possible. I was having this conversation with a company yesterday where if you don't get those in initial questions right, you're always going back and going back and asking again and again. And it's frustrating for you. It's frustrating to the client. It's frustrating for the candidate if they're asking you questions and you don't know. So the document that I referenced, you've got whew, a good, I think, 72 opening questions, <laughs> opening questions. So in other words, start the conversation off, but then you've got to qualify. Then you've got to make sure that you are probing, asking more information. Don't just accept that first answer. Delve into it. Uh, the session with Kate yesterday, we were talking about the fact that, yeah, positions you could get a title and in one company it means you're doing 95 percent of one thing in another company you're only doing five percent of that thing and lots of other things as well so again that qualifying gathering as much information as possible to really understand what that role is about now when you're take, taking a role um reference the rec qualification here they look at it from 14 different aspects of the role so, yes, that includes the duties and the responsibilities. They're just two of the 14. Um, and then seven aspects of the ideal person. So those characteristics of an ideal person. And I'm sorry, but the only way I can remember this is spagdic. So special attributes, um, physical makeup, because that does impact on some roles. Obviously, there are uh, elements that you have to be really careful around that as well. Attainment. So that's what they've gained in their life. Uh, this is 1930s language from Dr. Alec Rogers, but it's brilliant for qualifying whether who's the right person for the job. Not that they can just do it, but they're actually going to be ideal for the role as well. So attainments includes their education as well as their experience. And that's a huge topic just on its own out of the 21. G, general intelligence. <laughs> Uh, so there's problem solving skills, their, their ability uh, to be able to uh, integrate into a team, to be able to communicate with people. Yeah, just gen general intelligence and uh, general knowledge isn't always general, is it? Uh, so where have we got to the D? OK, disposition, personality, how they're going to fit into the culture, values, uh, what's important to them. I for interests. Again, is this something that's actually going to be a passion of theirs? Are they going to um, be the ideal person? Because actually it's something they've always wanted to do. They actually want to work for that company. Maybe they do things that um, are going to enhance the company. That's an interest of theirs. The interest could be in social media and therefore bringing that into the business. Uh, we've got uh, Blake on here this morning and Blake loves TikTok. He's starting to create our uh, TikTok. So uh, stick your link in there, Blake. Let's get people over there. Uh, we've got Charlotte and I playing swing ball last week, if you can remember swing ball at the uh, team conference. And we're working through all the coaches at the moment and the 10 of us in the core team now uh, and all our hobbies. So Kate O'Neill's, who was on yesterday, her TikTok's gone up. Uh, so do go and have a look at that. and We'll be uh, adding more on. I think it's probably my turn this week. So uh, it's got to be something to do with animals, anything and everything to do with animals for me. Right. We were on interests. There we go. Uh, there's my animals. And actually, it was at the team conference. I came across, I will post it for you, um, a moth that I have never seen in my life. It flies like a hummingbird. Not surprisingly, it was called the hummingbird hawk moth. Um, beautiful thing. Go and have a look. Amazing. And it was just in the car park at Whittlebury Hall. So that was fabulous. OK, where are we at? We're at the C at the end circumstances. Obviously, are they going to be able to work the hours that they need? Are they going to be able to work in the location? Does the um, maybe flexible working fit in with, with their life? Uh, so all of those elements, those seven are just around. Is the person going to be the ideal person, let alone whether the, the job is uh, for them as well? OK, I have spent a bit more time on that. I need to move on. Point two. 
Um, just to reiterate, bribing questions, the answers, making a recruitment plan. So now you've got the role. This bit gets skipped quite a bit. So this is literally like an action plan setting with the hiring manager what's going to happen. So a little sort of um, service level agreement between you, really. So what are you going to do? What are they going to do? When are you going to do it by? By how much? Set it all out. So, OK, I've got the job. I'm going to get back to you with an update tomorrow afternoon. I'm going to send you five CVs. We've agreed the number between us. You're going to arrange three interview times with the people that need to be in the interviews. And you're going to get back to me by tomorrow in that update and give me those times and dates. We're going to have those in the plan. We're then going to work towards those. We're going to make go through the CVs together. We'll pick the three. They're going to go for the interview. I'm going to arrange the interviews by this date. This is going to happen. All of a sudden, this is a partnership. We're working together to fill this position rather than them giving you a role and then you hoping you can get back to them <laughs> and get hold of them and be able to talk to them about the people that you've got. Don't leave it to chance. This is all part of the starting point when you're taking the role, add on to the end of it your recruitment plan and just use it as an action uh, page. I've got, I've got an example of one where it's literally just okay what are we going to do who's doing it what are the measurements when's it got to be done by and then you can have your tick at the end as well if you want but that makes such a difference put your signatures at the bottom it's not a legally binding document in any way shape or form but when someone puts a signature on something they probably commit to it a lot more than if they didn't um, so here now you've got your plan you've got your dates and if the client or the hiring manager is wavering off of those at least you can point them back to this is what we agreed to get your person for this date. OK, moving on then. Uh, point three. We've got um, making sure that you're sourcing, obviously, quali quality candidates uh, not so easy at the moment. So you've got to use everything in your power to find those people. This came up last Friday, actually, which is why, why I've put it in here. The good old six degrees of separation, or if you're old enough to remember the game, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. So the game was the fact that Kevin Bacon had been in so many major films. This is this is way back in the 90s, even by then, that you could connect him to any other actor in the world by six degrees, i.e. six other films. So start with a Kevin Bacon film, or start with a person, and then work your way back to a film where Kevin Bacon is in it same principle it was based on the six degrees of separation which is actually the fact that everyone on the planet is connected by six degrees so you could find uh, someone and, and be linked to someone within five connections between you um it was a film as well it was one of will smith's first films it was based on a play it's got stockard channing in it as well um unfortunately i can't recommend it it's bloody awful <laughs> but i watched it because i was training it um 3.7, what does that mean? They redid this a year or so ago based on the fact that we've all got social media now. We are now connected to everyone on the planet by 3.7 connections. I'm not sure who the seven is, um, but isn't that amazing? Everyone on the planet, and that's only just going to come down. I mean, that's within 20 years. It's gone from six to 3.7. Uh, so it's just phenomenal. So there are opportunities for you to find people. The issue that you may have is that you've got to find who are those hot hubs, who are the people that are those five connections in between to get you from A to B. So if you're A, your candidate is B, who do they know? And you've got to actually work with um, on an active basis to generate candidates, to generate connections, to build your network. So if you're just starting out in recruitment, um, then LinkedIn is your friend. <laughs> Uh, because that's one of the key reasons why that number has come down so much. So it's about identifying who are those people. So any of the people that work within the recruiting gym here, we are a hot hub for you. We have connections to so many people. Um, to give you an example, I was working, well, oh, bit the name drop, clang. We were working with Amazon last week and they were looking for someone. We're working with their resources and training them. And they were looking for someone in a very small town in the south of Germany. <laughs> that doesn't have a lot of connections uh, transport wise. So it wasn't as if even if someone from from a neighboring town, maybe an hour away could get there. No, wasn't great. Um, 
so whilst we were working together, we do co-working sessions. This is part of Catherine Robinson's sourcing circle, uh, 100 day sourcing circle, and therefore we co-work with them. We work with them on their sourcing and help them. And because of my connections, I did a search on this little town in Germany for an area manager. So for a specific position as well, I found four people. How phenomenal is that? Love it. So straight away, who you know is so important in this business and so make sure you're developing your network. Now, it looks easy there, nice and simple. Unfortunately, that's more likely what your network looks like. It's just a mass of people. How am I going to know? So you've got to get in and start identifying. You're the red. Who's the orange? Who's the people with all those connections? Because if I know them, they'll know someone else who'll know someone else. That's three degrees we're at now. Uh, oh, another 80s band. Uh, so that you're actually being able to find people as quickly as possible. And it's your network and those hubs. Or we used to call them bird dogs. Bird dogs are hunting dogs. So you get retrievers, soft mouth. They'll go and get the get the game for you, bring it back. So this is a, a retriever. I tend to be a retriever. If you are someone who do you know, go, oh, what about so-and-so? Let me go and speak to them and I'll connect you. So I'm doing that all the time on LinkedIn. Let me connect you with this person. Let me connect you with this person. A retriever, I'll get that person for you. Um, the other type of bird dog is a pointer, like a German pointer, I'm going to Germany for a lot today. Um, and literally, if you've never seen it, get on YouTube, a pointer does point with their paw. So if they can hear something rustling in the bushes, I was riding in the New Forest once, we stopped at a pub, as you do. Um, and this pointer was there and all of a sudden it, it pointed at the bushes. And I was like, what's it doing? And then it moved. And, and obviously the bud, the rabbit that was in the bush <laughs> moved with it. And it's putting its paw out and it's actually pointing. Um, yeah, a little freaky when you see it, but it is, but it is amazing. So pointers will actually say, well, go and talk to some so-and-so. And you've got to do the work yourself. So retrievers are a little bit easier for you. Um, but pointers are, are good as well, because at least then you're getting the right direction. You're heading on your way. So start working on those hubs, on those bird dogs. Who are the people in your network that's going to really help you? Right. Last bit then. Uh, step four, six essential qualifying questions. I'm not going to go through all these in detail. We have done this on a daily workout before. Um, it's also in our, um, uh, sorry, in, in our ca candidate sourcing and engagement course with, with Catherine. That initial bit of sourcing candidates, great, but are they actually going to be any good for the role? And are they also going to be any good for working for you? Are they going to re represent you well? Are they going to answer your calls? Are they going to turn up? Are they going to take the job when you offer it? These six questions are the key elements to be able to understand whether you've got any red flags in there or not. And if you have, we're in a candidate short market, you can now make the decision. You're mitigating the risk. You're understanding it a little bit more, You're asking questions and probing around issues. So things like knockout factors, is probably the only one on there that's not that obvious. So what would stop you taking your ideal job? You've been offered the job. It's what you want. It's the right salary. It's in the right location. There's nothing wrong with that what could potentially stop you? Now, obviously, the counter offer at the moment, you know, that offered more money in their own companies or more money from other positions that are being offered. It's always going to be a sway, but it could be family. It could be the fact that, uh, yeah, that <laughs> had a, a wife that said you're not working there because your ex-girlfriend works there, a husband saying, well, you're not working in the next town because uh, don't want you traveling on the bus in the winter, in the dark. It's it's things like this that just come out of nowhere that can knock out a placement. So it's right in phase one, we're establishing all the information we need for the role so we make the right match. We're making sure that we're in control with the client in partnership to make sure there's a recruiting plan that we both work to together. You're then identifying your candidates and they may already be in your network. You may have them registered already. Make sure you're talent pooling all the time don't wait until the job comes in. So you should be able to find that person a lot quicker than your competitors. And then it's about making sure, are they actually going to be right for you or your business? So whenever you speak to a, a candidate, qualify them and then re-qualify, re-qualify every time you speak to them because things can change overnight. This is great to use at the end of the interview. Have I covered everything? Have I made sure now our... Um, 
we, with, with our training, obviously, we, we go into a lot of detail with regards to the structure of the interview and how to go about it. But the aim at the end of it is to make sure that one, the person can do the job they say they can do. So through your questioning, through competency based questioning um, and obviously after the interview, through your referencing, it could be checking their LinkedIn recommendations. If someone's got five and they're all from colleagues then unfortunately, okay, great, you're on your way, um, but you're not going to take those <laughs> as qualification that, yeah, you're, you're good at what you do. If someone's got 20 plus from clients, from candidates, from other people that they've worked with in other companies, then actually all of a sudden the credibility rises. So I, I say to all consultants, in your first year, you're aiming to get 20 recommendations. Now, if you're a program consultant, that means 10 placements, get a recommendation from the candidate and from the client. Of course, you've got people you've worked with before, people you work in your own company. So it's realistic to get 20 recommendations in a year. Um, and now people are saying, and again, it's out there, it's for everyone to see, it will be on their profile as well that they've given it. So they're not likely to write something that they don't feel comfortable with. Um, so that's where that credibility comes in. OK, I've only got 10, 15 minutes, so I better crack on. Uh, motivation then. We talked about this in the essential qualifying questions. This is, are they number one motivated? Um, now, in a candidate driven market, you can go with the ones that say, actually, out of one to five, I'm probably a two. But again, it's a red flag. You need to know what's stopping them saying number one. Yeah, we want people that are highly motivated to make a move at this time. If you're going to go through the full registration, we want lots of people that are passive in our talent pool. You wouldn't necessarily go through the full interview with them um, if they're not ready to make a move at the moment. So it's those number one motivated, highly motivated. Yes, looking now, have already updated my CV, have been looking online, have picked five companies I'd love to work for. All of these are indications that they're highly motivated. Reasons motivated other than money, because what's going to happen <laughs> if they're just motivated by money, they're going to get counter offered, whether that's through their own company, through another company that's offering them jobs or through another agency. Potentially, um, you could be up against uh, recruitment agencies that are trying to place them elsewhere as well. Uh, so you need to make sure that there are other motivations and ideally four or five of those for them to make that move. Really delve into the candidate, find out what, what's important to them, what are their needs, what are their wants and link that back to their motivations to make the move. So it's either to leave the company they're in or to join a new company. So you've got a push and pull effect going on there. What's going to pull them away from the business that they're in if they're working at the moment? What's going to push them towards another one? Are they re realistic about the money they're asking for for the spec? Now, we know salaries have gone up at the moment. We know that people can ask for more, and that's the market. It's supply and demand. It always happens, but it will level itself out again. Um, so be wary of that, of the trends that that goes through. Um, it will even itself up over a period of time. But that could be years. So you need to be aware of what the market's doing at the moment and are they being realistic asking? So lots of probing questions around where they're getting that amount from. And if you know in the marketplace that that that's a good amount for what they're capable of, then obviously brilliant. They're an ideal candidate in relation to that point. Cooperative, committed, give them something to do the first time that you work with them. Now, ask them to send you something. Ask them to think about those companies they want to work for. Ask them to um, introduce you to someone else, potentially. Are they going to work with you or are they going to work against you? So, so give them an action and see how well they do on that first occasion. If they're motivated, if they want to work with you, they're going to complete it. OK, other side, reference checkable, obviously on contract, temporary, uh, you need to do that because um, they're going to be working for your company potentially. Um, but you need to do your due diligence and um, whether it's PERM as well, that they are capable of doing the job that they do. We've already talked about um, potentially getting references on them to check that already. Don't go to their current company. <laughs> Uh, potentially a soft reference you could get from the current company if there's someone in the business that's working with them that knows they're looking to make a move. Of course, you're going to take some of those um, comments with a pinch of salt. But again, it's a good indicator if someone is willing to give a soft reference. So a soft reference is someone that they is not their employer, not, not their um, line manager, someone that they've worked with. It could be someone on a project. Um, it could be a trainer that's been working with them over a period of time and has actually seen the growth and really understands their skills. So potentially someone that's not related to the business. 
chemistry that's a weird one this is about them fitting in with your company that you're going to be placing them so whether it's literally your company if you're in-house or your clients that you're working with are they going to get along are they going to fit the culture do their values fit they may be the best person in the world to do that job in one company but move them totally different story i'm sure you've all had experience of that someone that's very capable very highly skilled goes to an environment that's not right for them and, and is unable to deliver um, and that's why that culture fit is so important location wise we've got a lot of flexibility on that now because of working from home and if it is only one day a week they've got to be in the office they probably are willing to be a bit further away uh, but again that discussion's got to happen people aren't willing to be commuting an hour a day anymore there's no need for it uh, so we need to uh, look into what the options there now when they first start in the company they need to expect they're probably going to be in the office more often than not, if not full time, because they need to get to know the job. They need to get to know the team. Um, and that's going to be important. But have the conversation around if it's full time now in the office, what's the opportunity, maybe three months or six months after their probation for that to uh, develop and change? Again, that's testing their commitment for the role as well. Not too long or too short in a company. This is about red flags. So it doesn't mean that you're going to negate them. But if I was 13 years in one recruitment company, it never moved. But when you start asking the questions and delving, and that's why the probing questions are so important, you then find out that I was in five different locations in those 13 years and I had seven different job titles. <laughs> so probably a year and a half at each, moving on, moving on, moving on. Um, so yes, I was very ambitious and yes, I wanted, I was happy to move and relocate from my job. Very different to someone that's been doing the same job for 13 years in one location with the same team or same boss. Yeah, so you can see the issues that might cause when they come to leave like family for them it's like an institution at this point um, and therefore that can be really difficult and the guilt factor kicks in and they're probably going to be able to sway them so you've really got to delve into those motivators why now what's the difference what's the motivation factor for now what's the impending event that's coming up maybe could be that they've been made redundant great factor obviously they're going to be interested and they're going to be yeah, motivated too short this is the job hoppers now we're having lots of discussions around this recently because actually you might find where uh, when I started over 30 years ago, two years was considered OK. Um, so if you had two years in each role, then that was fine. Anything less than that. And you were sort of looked on as mm, not sure about you. But we know now people are looking for purpose in the roles. And if they're not finding it and if in, within the first year, they're not getting the culture that they need and the development that they need, that they are moving on. So that is coming down less and less. So you need to have the discussion about your marketplace. What would they expect? What do your clients expect? But you could find that a year is OK. We've had those conversations. And if they've had a year in each job, then actually that's fine. They wouldn't be considered a job hopper. So more discussion around that than, than we used to have a lot more. And then finally, there's something to sell. And this links us on to point six um, in, in our uh, phase two that we want to make sure uh, that when we're presenting the candidate to the hiring manager, we're sharing those something to sales. We're picking out the key points. So ideally, you want at least five. What, what are their achievements? What are their accomplishments? What are they proud of? What is makes them different and stand out? So for me, the question was always, you're down to the last two. You both want the last uh, the same salary. Client can't choose between you. Why would they choose you? and get that information out of them during the interview so that they can sell themselves. And some people are very good at that. Some are definitely not. <laughs> so please make sure uh, that you help them with that to identify five key things and be specific. So if they've got loads of experience, don't say that to the hiring manager. They've got loads of experience. Say they've got 17 years of experience in this field in three different countries on two different continents, all of a sudden, loads of experience becomes very specific in the sense of a picture of that person, of, of how capable they may be. Yeah, they've been responsible for large budgets in the past. Well, what was large to you? It might be two million, it might be two billion. Again, get the specifics. The client will then be able to determine whether that's relevant to them or not. And hopefully you've taken enough detail on the job spec that you know that's impressive to them. So five things that you can be able to present to the, ca the candidate uh, 
when you're speaking to the hiring manager. So whether that's through a profile on a CV that you're sending across or whether you're actually speaking to them, ideally, you want to do both. Maybe if you can get direct interviews, fantastic. We'll choose three people. We'll make sure you've got the CVs. We'll go through them beforehand for interview. That was my ideal with a client. I didn't want to have to wait for feedback on CVs. So I always wanted to go for the direct interviews when I took the job, booking in those dates. You'll see that on the form uh, that we've got for you to download. What we also want um, is for that discussion to happen. So you can share with them. Here's where I think they're really strong and they're really relevant to the job. Here's where you might want to question a little bit further. Again, you're the consultant. You're actually helping the person to determine where their strengths and development areas are. Now, you're going to help the candidate as well, because that's our next stage. Preparing the candidate, that briefing. It's so important to make sure. So in the daily workout, in the course, there will be um, a document to download with like 25 points <laughs> to pre prepare and brief the candidate on. And then we've got the briefing of the client as well added to that. Just going to focus on the candidate for today. So what type of things do they want to hear? What are the key importance? What are the essentials within the role? So make sure that they are weighting their answers based around what's most important. So give them that indication. You don't want them going off on a tangent, talking about something that actually is only 5% of the job. Um, and therefore, they're not giving themselves a best chance of um, getting the offer. How do they want them to communicate? So let them know what the interview is going to be. Is it going to be a presentation? I, used to, I only about once. I felt so bad when the person turned up for an interview and hadn't found out that actually it was a panel interview and they were expected to stand up in front of them <laughs> and give a mini presentation. Yeah, they never mentioned this. And obviously I never asked, so it's my fault. But those type of things can throw a candidate off totally. So make sure you know exactly what the format of the interview is going to be and how they're going to be communicating their information. Um, how far should they share things about themselves? Again, that's about knowing the personality of the interviewer. Some people are very open, very friendly, like to know lots more about you as an individual. Others don't. <laughs> They're very to the point, very about the job. Get on with it. What can you do? What have you done before? Um, so again, giving them a direction of the style of the interviewee uh, needs to be for the person. That can make a big difference. What are they like to face? We've mentioned that already, the type of things, but also around stupid things like parking. <laughs> How bad has it been? Have you ever been to an interview and you can't find somewhere to park <laughs> and you just get more and more stressed and you're starting to sweat and you got there 20 minutes early, hoping to walk through the door a quarter of an hour, maybe 10 minutes early, and now the time is ticking away. Okay, prepare them uh, for what they're like to face, what it's like to be, who they are, who they're going to be meeting, the type of business that it is. Uh, that's going to be critical. OK, how can you make their experience more pleasant? Anything you can give them in that briefing that's going to mean that they are prepared and they know what they're going to be doing uh, is giving them the chance. And that's what you're there for. So that first client interview, then all of that in the briefing, what are they going to face? Uh, I, I, I must admit, I'm sure you've seen <laughs> seen this one before uh, they're going to ask their strengths and weaknesses aren't they uh, so therefore definitely get them prepped for that as well um, give them an idea of the time frames set up the debriefing for afterwards so for the candidate to come out and maybe you're expecting a call within 15 minutes you want their initial thoughts you want to know how it went when they get back to the car when they get to the train station take a moment give me a call let me get some initial feedback so that you've got it raw because you're likely to get the honest truth at that point, um, whether it went well or it didn't. And if it didn't go well, you're getting the debrief from the candidate first. So that's going to make a difference when you speak to the client. So debriefing. OK, what happened generally? Just let them talk. And ideally, this is sort of in the hour after they've been or the end of the first day. Um, so what did the hiring manager really show an interest in? What, what were they um, really happy to talk to you even further about? Where did the conversation flow? What went well? What didn't go so well? But what didn't go so well, again, tam pam perm, you really want to identify at this point if there are any issues. It's also whether the candidate didn't portray themselves in the best light possible or they, you know, when they come out and they go, ah, I could have said this. <laughs> 
that's when you want to get that information. So you debrief the candidate first before we're going to go back to the hiring manager, the interviewer, because we want to know if there's any issues. And if there is something they've thought of since, you can get in there straight away. And it might allay any fears that the, uh, the hiring manager had. Go, ah, OK, yeah, I wasn't impressed with that answer. I thought they could have done better there. So actually what you just said there, that's perfect. So make sure you get to speak to the candidate first before you get to speak to the client again. Um, would you like the job? Obviously, if it's a permanent job, if it's a temporary job, you go back tomorrow. <laughs> Always helpful. Um, and as I say, you want to try and get as much information at this point before you now go back to the, uh, the line manager and do a debrief with them. Same scenario. From there, then, if it's all good. So if it's a permanent, then, it, then it's going to be an offer. If it's a temporary, it might be a rebook. And they're actually going back. So you want to manage this situation. You want to be the one that's coordinating everything. You don't want to lose control at this point. Don't let it be that the, the hiring manager, or the line manager is the one that is actually organizing everything, speaking to them, making the offer. Uh, same again with, with the temporary that they're booking them, they're letting them know because what happens is you may have got them another booking for next week because you thought it was finishing on the Friday. You call up on the Thursday and you find out, oh, no, no, no I've already spoken to them. Yeah, they're coming back next week. <laughs> no, I'll book them elsewhere. You need to be in control of this. So set those expectations right from the start that you'll be managing this process. If they want them back, then you'll get to speak to them. Um, and you will be reviewing and checking what they've been doing in the job. And certainly if they keep rebooking them or if it's a longer term booking, then you find out that they've got more skills. They're using more skills. They, they, they're doing more in the job. They should be paid more. So, again, that expectation that you will review if it's a longer term booking what they're doing. But from an offer point of view, you want to have the contracts. You want to see those contracts. Uh, so that you can then make an offer. Now, if you're in-house and HR are dealing with it, OK, that, that's fine. But make sure you're involved in all of those conversations. But from an agency point of view, you want to get to see that contract. So ideally, when you're taking the role, you want to say when the offer's made, send the contracts to us. We'll sit down with the candidate. We'll go through it with them, allay any problems, any fears, any questions that they've got. So you're not having to deal with that. So if you can send us three copies, two for the candidate, um, they'll sign both. They'll keep one. They'll send one back to you and one for us for our files as well. Now, you may think this is a bit overkill, uh, but having been in the industry for quite a while, you tend to find out, that unfortunately, not everyone has as much integrity as maybe you do. And they may say to you, if your fees change at a certain level, a lot of companies will have not to 25,000 at one percentage fee, and then maybe 25,001 to 50,000 at another fee, another fee. If it's around that 25,000 stage, they're going to tell you they're offering 24,5, but they've actually agreed with the candidate 26. And of course, that then makes a difference on your fee. So the contract goes out for 26. They've told the candidate, don't worry, the agencies can say 24,5. When you get the contract, you'll see what it is. That's fine. Sign that, send it back. It still happens. <laughs> um, now, Obviously, you can deal with this by not having that in your T's and C's, uh, but terms and conditions, by the way. Um, but the likelihood is they are there. So make sure that you are in control. And again, it really helps you to do those things that I did mention before. But the final bit is for you. Just making sure what is being offered is actually what you're expecting. And there might be um, a lot more detail in the bonus package there or in the in the benefits and the compensatory. And a lot of people's T's and C's actually have that the first year's salary, the invoice is based on the first year salary plus the benefits. So if they're getting a, a bonus of 20,000 OTE in the year, then that's what you should be invoicing on. Again, it helps to really challenge with the client if that OTE on target earning is reality or not, or whether they're bigging up the position. No one's ever earned that much. And therefore, this person's probably going to get a little bit dissuaded three, four months in because there's no way they're going to earn that when they thought they would. So lots of different ways of controlling and challenging and making sure that everyone's telling the truth.
So that step I know a lot of people don't do. They leave it up to the client. It all gets done between the two of them. Um, so if it's being sent out, you want copied in um, so that you can have your own copy. Uh, and make sure then that you've got that on file and you go through it with the candidate. Make sure that they are very clear on everything. And there's unlikely to be anything dodgy in there. Every now and again, something will pop up and you'll think that's a bit weird. Let me talk to, to them about it. But a lot of the time it is standard. And even if the candidate's thinking, oh, I'm not sure about this, maybe they've never actually read their contracts before, all of a sudden you can then allay their fears for them. So that's point 10. Again, all about control, making sure things are going to happen, that you're pushing it forward, that things aren't wasting time. I'm hearing a lot where companies aren't getting the contracts out and it's weeks later. And obviously that candidate is just going to get cold feet and potentially take something else in the meantime. So that's where this comes in. Let's help them. They've got the contract. They've got the details. They're happy. They've signed. Now they've got to resign. So you would have been talking about counter offers with them right from the start in that initial uh, qualifying, which was step four. You'll have made sure that they're going to be prepared for it. If they're working at the moment, they are going to get counter offered. This was always the case, but especially at the moment. And the likelihood is the amount of money they're going to get offered is, is quite a chunk because of the time, the effort, the resource and actually the difficulty in finding good staff at the moment. They're going to want to keep them. So they're going to, they're going to offer them quite things now. They have you have to go back before they resign and really reiterate around the motivating factors that, again, we picked up at point four when we were qualifying them. What was the reasons why they're moving? Because it wasn't just money. Remember, we asked for five things that weren't just money because, yes, we know the counter offer is, is a um, light. But what was the reason that you wanted to go in the first place? Going through those elements, you talked about how much they would have to offer for them to consider to stay. So straight away, if the counter offer comes in and it's lower, they know they can say no straight away and they're moving. Give them that confidence to be able to say no. If it's a lot higher than what they were expecting, then get them to say, I'm going to think about it. Don't say yes, <laughs> because you're going to get swayed by the money. Everyone's likely to be getting pay rises this year um, and into next year, unless it, it changes drastically, which it could do. So if you are going to get a big chunk now, there's the potential come the end of the year that you won't get the next pay rise. And I did have that happen to a tra trainer that was working with me um, where they, they were looking to move. They offered them um more money they stayed we all got pay rises in the team there was like 23 trainers in this team uh for this recruitment agency and they didn't they were the only one that didn't and when they went and asked and they said well you had yours earlier this year <laughs> so a lot of the time it's like your next pay rise anyway you've just got it a bit early so it doesn't sound so good now does it because it's like a couple of months was it worth it for that amount of money um, the difference that it made and you've now stayed and those issues are potentially still there hopefully they've resolved them if they're going to ask you to stay they should listen to those motivating factors is why you wanted to leave in the first place and hopefully they have changed that but let's help them out so I'm going to put in the uh, daily workout the resignation letter uh, that uh, I always used. So it sets out for them the fact that they have got another position. They have signed the contract. So that's why you do it in that order as well. Um, they loved working with them. They've learned a lot. They really appreciate their time. You wish them all the best, uh, but you have now signed a contract and therefore your decision is irrevocable. Um, so that's great. If you can help them, give them the letter that actually really points it out. It's a nice letter, very positive from both sides, but it is saying I'm going. Then that can really help them to move forwards. You want to know when they're resigning. You want to call them before on that day. You want to call them an hour after you know that it's going to be happening. You should be their support network at this part time. So think about all the recent placements that you've made. This one is on the permanent side. Did you do this? Did it not go through? <laughs> because we're getting loads of counter offers. Of course we are. We always do anyway, but they're even stronger at the moment. Um, it's not just their own companies. It's other agencies as well and other companies that they've applied to. Because if you haven't got them exclusive, 
And that's part of that interview process to make sure that you ask them for exclu exclusivity if you can, even if it's for a week, just to get them out, get them interviews, and then hopefully you will be the one placing them and they won't have lots of offers elsewhere because you'll have got them two or three interviews. So this is all about control and making sure you get through to that last stage. They've resigned, they've accepted, they're going to start. So this communication, post-placement activities. So you've made the placement, they're due to start. That could be next week, that could be three months time. This could be from a temporary point of view as well. You've booked them for two weeks time. We want to make sure we keep in contact. We call them on a regular basis, put it in the diary, keep in touch, make sure that you're doing those things. Always be closing. Every time you speak to them, make sure that, yeah, that they're, they're excited, what they're looking forward to, ask a different question each time to get them talking about the position. Uh, get them to be an advocate for you. So ask for a LinkedIn recommendation or a Google review. This is a great time to do it in between them starting because you've done all the work. They're really happy with what you're doing. They're going to be starting. So make sure that they're actually an advocate for you and utilize them that way. OK, scheduling in the diary, those times of what's going to happen when. Now, you've got the communication beforehand, but you also want the communication afterwards. So this um, for us were three 7-11 calls because the rebate period was at four, eight and 12 weeks. We wanted to catch it a week before if there was anything that was likely to go wrong so that we could actually sort it out with the candidate, with the client. So after placements, if it's a temporary booking, then again, you need to be scheduling in times during the week. And if it's a long term booking, whether it's every week or every other week that you are catching up with both the candidate and the client, making sure that everything's OK, everyone's happy, what's happening in the future. Um, from a 360 point of view, um, this is a rolling program. So you've taken someone, you've placed them that potentially have been in a job somewhere or doing a booking elsewhere. So what's happening with that one? So this this is uh, making sure that, yes, you're, you're actually yeah, going back um, and finding those opportunities because that's an opportunity for you as well. Um, and a lot of people will actually um, make loads of placements throughout the year where they're just moving people around from one, from one to the next and filling the ones that they've left. OK, then work out your percentages. How long did it take from taking the job to actually uh, the placement? What was that time frame? So do it to the offer because you haven't got control of, of when they start and, and times that uh, they're available. Uh, so do it from taking the job on to the offer. What was that time? Now, I was only a perm consultant for a year, but I knew during that time, I think I made 114 placements and my average time from job take to offer was 17 days. So I could use that with my clients. Those stats and those figures are really helpful when you're taking a job on, when you're trying to get a new client, letting them know this is my average. Does that work for you? Yes, of course, they're going to say that. Brilliant. Within three weeks, we've got our new person offered. Great. This is the process that I use, these 12 steps. And therefore, are you happy to work with me on this? Great. Let's get it in a recruiting plan. Let's make sure that we're actually uh, putting the time frames in there. We're working to that time at 17 days. And then let's say they're going to have to give a month's notice. The earliest they're going to start is this on a temporary basis. Again, you want to make sure that uh, you're letting them know that we, we would normally aim to feel something within an hour if it's for today. And we let you know at 20 minutes that someone's on the way. Give them those stats. Give them that information because it's that that's going to give them some more confidence. 